in the last session we started very briefly chapter 11 of the Tripura Rahasya. A quick recap of the Tripura Rahasya. It's an amazing tantric text of our tradition and it is a conversation between Parshurama, uh, a great warrior as well as at that point of time a student, a seeker, and his teacher Dattatreya. As Parshurama questions Dattatreya about different aspects of sadhana, practice, nature of the universe, and various aspects of practice, Dattatreya narrates many stories in order to illustrate his point. Now we are at chapter 11 after we have completed the very interesting and exciting story of the prince Hemachuda who was enlightened by the teachings of his wife the princess Hemaleka. Still after this very illuminating story of the prince and princess Parshurama still has some doubts and some questions. So he speaks to his teacher, Dattatreya, and says, That's all wonderful what you've said, but it is difficult to understand. How can the external world be just consciousness? Now, the point that Hemaleka left off with, Hemaleka, the princess, tells her husband, Hemachuda, you want to go inward and seek the self. That's all well and good, wonderful. But the external world is also consciousness. Everything is consciousness. And so, in the end, when Hemachuda is fully enlightened being, he is able to amass wealth, and conquer enemies, indicating to us that wealth and success in life is not something we need to renounce or consider to be in opposition to the spiritual path. As many people are under the impression that if you're on the spiritual path, you have to renounce these or that wealth is something bad. Worldly success is also not good. And this attitude actually is self-negating. This text, tantric text, is not life-negating, it is life-affirming. So, Parshurama asks, I, I got your point of the story, but how can the external world be consciousness? That's not how I perceive it. And he says, I can accept your claim based on faith, but not through direct experience. So he says, I trust you, my teacher, completely, and if you say so, it must be true, but I do not know it myself through my experience. So, how do I understand this? And the Tatreya replies. And that's where we left off the last time. And so we continue from there. O Parshurama, I will reveal the secret of the existence of the external world. This entire universe exists only in the eyes of the perceiver. It has no existence of its own. I will tell you the way. Listen carefully. These objects are said to be effects, having a cause behind them. Anything 
that appears in a new form is called birth. The universe changes its form all the time. That's why it always looks totally different. In our last session, we also talked about <clears throat> the birth that happens when we go through this complete transformation and we become new beings that seeing the world through these different eyes is like new birth. We talked very briefly towards the end about these rituals which enact that symbolically, the, ex the yogic experience which occurs when, when, when the kundalini rises, when one is awakened. And that is called the second birth or it's considered to be the death of the past. So we talked about Shiva, Lord of Destruction, is really a symbol of that part which dies. When Shiva comes forward, everything else dies. Or Kali, Goddess of Destruction, is about destroying the ego, Ahankara. Here, of course, we're talking about taking a new body. So when you, it appears a new form, it's birth. So anything which changes its form and appears in a new form is birth. And it looks totally different. Some learned people believe that objects are born every moment, while others consider the external world to be a combination of basic elements. However, all these viewpoints conclude that this universe is a product. We cannot believe that this universe is produced without any sufficient cause, because it cannot be produced without consciousness. Through the syllogism called Anvaya Vyakti, Rekas is even difficult for me to pronounce. The universal relationship between cause and effect can be determined. Therefore, the world could not come into existence without its cause. Sometimes the cause of an effect is not apparent. In that case, one can imagine it. This is a valid inference and has been confirmed by the wise. Generally, an effect is preceded by a cause. If the cause is not seen, then one should infer the cause, as one does in other cases. Otherwise, the universal relationship between cause and effect would be contradictory. Whenever people want to do something, they start collecting equipment and preparing materials for it. Therefore, all objects have their cause. Some believe that the universe is a production of atoms, which being invisible and insentient are almost non-existent. Although the material world evolves from those atoms, this is entirely different from non-existence. Coexistence of real and unreal is self-contradictory. That which is not yellow cannot be yellow, and light cannot be dark. Therefore, the two contradict each other. If this principle is denied, the statement will be full of defects. Even through the will of God, how can activity arise in primordial nature, which is unconscious? So, to, to, to just understand this thinking, is simply cause and effect. All of us have seen this and experiencing this all the time. This cause and effect is happening all the time and we are so dependent on it at an unconscious level, we don't think about it at all. But this life around us wouldn't function if we wouldn't believe that certain actions lead to certain effects. 
that's cause and effect. You know, if you do something, there will be a certain result. If you don't do something, you don't get that result. And in every aspect of life, we have experienced this and we know it at an unconscious level, if not at a conscious level. And a lot of things we just take for granted because it's accepted completely. And this is happening all the time all around us. And this contradiction cannot work. There has to be cause and effect. The two are related to each other. So it gives the example here also of what is not yellow cannot be yellow and light cannot be dark. You cannot have two contradictory things. If there's a contradiction, then how can something living come out of something that is unconscious? So there has to be something conscious around us. So this idea that the material world is basically all non-living, dead matter, in that sense, does not really, cannot be really true. At a yogic level, we do speak like that. We do say that without Shakti, even Shiva is a corpse. Without Shakti, Shiva is a Shava. That's how we say. So it's a yogic level. But when we examine this far deeper, we see that everything is consciousness. So Shakti is required. Otherwise, even Shiva is a Shava. That means even the self cannot have the quality of life. Of what use is life when there is no world around? So both are required. Light and dark is required. Cause effect is required. This duality of the world around us is required. If we try to keep only one aspect and hold on to this one aspect, we begin to suffer. Uh, a trait that most people have is that we want to have only happiness. We only want to have pleasures. We don't want to have suffering. We don't want to have misery of any kind. We want our desires to be fulfilled. So we hang on to only one part. We don't accept life in all its forms. Suffering as well as joy. All the dualities. It doesn't mean that I necessarily want to suffer, but we don't, if we hang on to joy and happiness, we also miss the other part of life. And we know from the text, the earlier part, that in suffering is joy. And in joy there is also suffering. So this duality will always remain. We cannot escape this duality. By hanging on to one part of it, by hanging on to a part of it, we limit ourselves always. And that's what this, this limitation, when we limit ourselves, it helps us to function. But it also limits us. We are not fully aware. We fall from our divine state, from our godlike nature. To return to our godlike nature, we must accept all dualities. And then we realize that everything is consciousness. Nothing is unconscious. Even matter has consciousness. The external world is also conscious. Any questions or thoughts so far?
Okay, we continue with verses 19-20. Dattatreya continues. Therefore, in the beginning of creation, Prakriti, the primordial cause from which this universe evolves, consists of three basic but unconscious aspects. Yet one never sees any action appearing in the unconscious principle without conscious direction. In this way, the cause of the universe remains unseen. And for determining the nature of that unseen cause, the sayings of the Vedas alone furnish evidence. The individual perceiver is imperfect. So, other than authoritative testimony, nothing can inform us of that unseen cause. An effect is never found without a cause. Therefore, this universe is the work of some doer. That doer must be pure consciousness. The universe is a stupendous effect beyond all human compre comprehension. That power beyond comprehension is complete and the Vedas explain it. That self-existent reality is explained by the Vedas beyond all doubts. If we shortly visit our diagram, yeah, it will just clarify this. And we know that this is the external world here, outside. These are the senses with which we are able to see the world. This is the body, the breath, conscious mind with which we interact in this world. This is the unconscious mind here, which remains mostly hidden. We remain unaware of this. And so all this, the unconscious mind, the conscious mind, body, senses, breath, the entire external world, all is part of matter or prakriti. So who is the doer? The doer is the center of consciousness then. This is something which is beyond comprehension because who comprehends? We make an effort to comprehend with our conscious mind. But the conscious mind is so limited. <clears throat> it's just a small part. How can this limited part understand or comprehend or know this part which is unlimited? It cannot. It's like trying to say that a candle should compete with the light of the sun. Candle cannot know, you cannot know the light of the sun with a candle light. The Tatraya continues, Lord Maheshwara existed before creation. He is perfectly independent. Without using any object or means or materials, Maheshwara on his own created a canvas and painted on it. That is what the universe is. While dreaming, a person creates an entire dream world in his mind and identifies with his dream body. Yet when he awakens, his dream body vanishes. Similarly, at the time of annihilation, the world dissolves, but the self-existent reality remains as it is. As your body is different from your consciousness, similarly the world is different from self-existent pure consciousness. He projected this universe on himself. This is all that. We can go back to our diagram and see who is Lord Maheshwara, who would like to 
answer this question in this diagram. Who is Lord Maheshwara? <clears throat> the immortal self? Yes. Yes. So, yes, everybody writing. Vishal says center of consciousness. Rajesh says the immortal, immortal self. Perry says the absolute. Bhavan says Adipra, Pranayam. So, Everybody basically said the same thing, used different words for it. Pavan, Adi, Pranayam, I'm not too sure what you mean by, uh, by that. If you mean Adi Prana, Adi Prana is, is connecting the immortal self with this um, entire construct for a lack of a better word. And so, yes and no, uh, the, the, the answer would be, of course, center of consciousness, or as everybody else put it in different words, the immortal self, the absolute, center of consciousness, pure consciousness, and the word which has caused so many wars all around the world, God. This is that divine part which is unlimited, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. And that is pure consciousness. And in this scripture is referred to as Lord Maheshwara. Lord Maheshwara created this as a canvas. So what is the canvas now? And what did he paint on this canvas? So what is the canvas here? Nobody? So is it possible to... Oh. Yeah, go ahead, Manisha. Well, I was just thinking, like, there can be, I don't know if there could be layers of canvas. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times we think about the, the canvas and that's where the senses, you know, what you're seeing, hearing, mm -hmm. tasting, touching. Mm -hmm. um, but there could be the deeper layers so that everything to the left could be considered part of that canvas, canvas wherever we get the mm -hmm. impressions, wherever mm -hmm. there is an impression. Yes, yes, exactly. Actually, everything is the canvas. Not just everything to the left. Yes, I know. You mean adiprana, latent, active, conscious, breath, body, senses, external world. Yes, everything is part of the canvas, including the center of consciousness itself, because... Everything is consciousness. So that's the canvas. The whole picture here, the whole diagram, the entire diagram is the canvas. And that canvas also has a name. Anybody wants to take a guess? Yeah, Rajesh wrote consciousness, Perry wrote everything other than the absolute conscious. Then Brahman, yes, Brahman, Brahman. Brahman is, is a very good word. So everything here, all this, the entire canvas, this white part, this white, this white is Brahman. Universal consciousness is what we say in English. While Maheshwara is universal consciousness or center of consciousness. So you have the drop in the ocean. The drop is individual consciousness or center of consciousness. And the ocean is universal consciousness or Brahman or Paramatman. So Atman and Paramatman or Brahman. 
these are basically the same because this drop which is in you this drop of pure consciousness is also everywhere around us everything is consciousness everything is shakti so vishal said maya now what's the difference between maya and consciousness and shakti anybody would like to to comment what is maya and this is the illusion yes created by the play of the, you know all that is the you know if we say that the cause is the consciousness mm-hmm. our and you said the other word shakti yes yes and the power mhm yes everything is shakti everything is shakti this white canvas shakti is another word for universal consciousness or parmatma so everything is shakti and maya is when we are not aware that this is shakti when we are not aware or oh, we are deluded and we think this is matter then that is maya so normally what happens is that because of this aspect of the conscious mind that limits us everything that's here then in this part here all this becomes maya because you are unaware that you are actually center of consciousness so maya is not easy to depict in this diagram it's not a part of what i call the yogic anatomy and so do we go back to our text and continue from there so we saw that maheshwara universal self created a canvas and created this world in the sense of it was not a creation really but a more manifestation all this came forward it appeared it came forward it's not creating something out of nothing it's building blocks and the building blocks were our pure consciousness so while dreaming a person enters into an entire dream world you saw that in the active and the latent unconsciousness you had also this consciousness and in your dream you have a dream body and you identify with all these things you have fearful dreams and you're really scared in your dreams today uh or yesterday we had a nice question which was put out in the um satsang group that was asked by manash actually and we talked about fears conscious and unconscious fears and you can be conscious when you're awake that you're f- afraid of snakes or dogs but in in the dream you realize that you are also afraid of ghosts that that was the the question why are we not aware of this fear of ghosts in the waking state why do we think we are okay with ghosts no i don't even believe in ghosts but then you realize in your dream because you had a nightmare that you were afraid of ghosts so this part is cutting off this conscious mind limits you and you remain unaware of the unconscious mind and so in the dream state you have a dream body and you have all these things happening and that world is basically not different from the external world there is no much difference in many ways it's it's all it's entirely the same and so you don't know which is the dream and which is the reality
And so it says basically everything is consciousness. It appears that your body is different from consciousness. It appears that the world is different from pure consciousness because he projected this universe. And this is all that. So this is that. It's the same. They both are pure consciousness. When verse 29 says, when there's only one reality, then how can this universe be projected? There cannot be two existences. By denying consciousness, even the existence of time and space cannot be proven. Through what means can one prove the absence of consciousness? Consciousness is certainly the highest reality. Reality is ever illuminated and underlies the entire universe of name and form. Waves cannot exist without the ocean, nor light without the sun, nor can the universe exist without the substratum of consciousness. At the time of creation, there was Maheshwara, a pure supreme consciousness. This entire universe is born from him, is maintained in him, and finally dissolves into him. So, Maheshwara is universal consciousness, everything. This theory is supported by the Agamas, the revealed scriptures. There can be no question about its validity. Whenever a doubt about the unseen and unknown arises, the sayings alone furnish evidence. Does anybody know what the Agamas are? Agama and Nigama. There are two of them. Does anybody know? <laughs> yes, I was expecting that from Shibu. The conversations between Shiva and Parvati are the scriptures and when Shiva is teaching Parvati, Parvati or Shakti, when Shiva is teaching, it is Agama. And when Parvati is teaching Shiva, then it is Nigama. So, both the scriptures are conversations one is Shivite, where Shiva is the main aspect that you identify with. And the other one is the Shakta scriptures. That is, when you talk about the Divine Mother, Shri, Shri Vidya, this is our tradition, where the focus is this, the, the, the consciousness that is in the world. Everything is consciousness. Ultimately, the teachings of both are the same, only the perspective differs. So, in, as I said, in one, Shiva teaches, and in the other, Shakti teaches. Is the teacher. Verse 35. There are certain unusual powers attained through mantras and gems. The power of mantras and gems cannot be comprehended by individuals with limited knowledge. Likewise, the scripture's descriptions of supreme reality and the path to attaining it must be valid, even though they are sometimes difficult to understand. Therefore, the Agamas revealed by Maheshwara are the greatest and most reliable source of knowledge related to the absolute reality. In those scriptures it is said that before the manifestation of the universe, the Lord alone existed in his glory. He manifested the universe without anyone's help because he is perfect, pure and sovereign. He projects the universe on his own screen of consciousness. The universe cannot exist outside of him. So the gist of these verses is, that having a limited knowledge, since we do not know the Absolute Self, we do not have limit, unlimited knowledge, we are not omniscient, so with the limited knowledge, 
we have to have some amount of faith and we are, we either accept those who are wiser than us the teachers or the scriptures the scriptures reveal this knowledge and we have to accept it because they have a greater view it's like the one standing on the summit has a wider view and can see very far and you can rely on his testimony but you're down and so you cannot see far you don't have that far sight you don't have vision so you have to rely on the testimony of the scriptures until you yourself have reached the summit so now the agamas say that all this is consciousness and the universe is projected on this screen of consciousness the universe cannot exist outside of consciousness because the supreme being is all pervading nothing remains apart from him for anything beyond the pale of consciousness could never be known to exist if you accept that the universe appears in the supreme being like a reflection exists in a mirror then all problems are solved the manifestation of the universe is like the action of a yogi that created this universe with his will power here we talk always about manifestation the idea that a lot of modern people have is we talk about creation and god created the universe or the world in yoga we talk about manifestation and not creation and all this manifested out of pure consciousness and the deep root behind manifestation is desire remember if you have a body which you do if you have a body you had the desire to be born and you had the desire to be here to live this out so desire is the root which leads to this entire play of consciousness verses 42 43 that atraya continues o parshurama your fantasies are entirely ima- purely imaginary yet even in those many unique and worldly objects appear and disappear but actually everything in your imagination is only the projection of your mind all that appears and disappears does so within the mind just as imaginary objects have the quality of the mind so things appearing from maheshwara the pure con- supreme consciousness share his nature pure consciousness has no physical or visible body tripura is identical to pure consciousness and finite power is her essential nature she is perfect and without limitation and witnesses the pure whole universe so we need to understand this train of thinking that just as in our dreams when we dream all the dream objects have the quality of dreams of of the mind so similarly when maheshwara creates something maheshwara's quality is consciousness so everything is consciousness has that quality of consciousness this world is like his dream it's just play so everything is consciousness and who is tripura tripura is identical to pure consciousness and she witnesses the whole universe 
सो हु इज त्रिपुराना Does anybody know what Tripura means? Prana, Shubhu says Prana. Does Tripura mean Prana? Isn't it the the mystery, the three cities? The mm -hmm. is that not what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yes, Tripura is the mystery. So would it not? Cities? Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, continue. So the show. states of the waking, dreaming, and sleeping? Yes. Yes. Rajesh writes the four states of consciousness. I want to just make a little correction to that. I, I don't want to, <laughs> you know, have an have a argument about that. It's just a... It's a minor thing, actually. It's three plus one, yeah. <laughs> so there's the conscious mind, which is the waking state. There's the active unconscious mind, which is the dream state. And there's the latent unconscious mind, which is deep sleep. And these are actually the three levels of consciousness, or Tripura, which is three cities. So these are the three cities, and we live in these three cities. So who are we that we are living in these three cities? We are the center of consciousness. So Tripura is the one who lives in these three cities. That is another word for center of consciousness. So that is what Tripura means. Nothing other than still another word for the center of consciousness or Atman, or the Absolute, the, the Reality, um, the Witness. There are so many different words for the same thing, adding sometimes a lot of confusion. <laughs> and actually, it is very simple. So we can go back to the text. So that's Tripura is still another word, is witness, the one witnessing the three states of consciousness. Because Tripura is not a state of consciousness, because the Atman it's not a state of consciousness, it's the one witnessing. Therefore, it's also called Turya, the fourth. So it's technically not a state of consciousness, which is why I wanted to make that point. But I think Rajesh is very much aware of it. We continue. Um, there's a question from Shibu. What's the difference between prana and consciousness? Actually, nothing. There's not, no difference. There are different levels of prana in prana itself. And... A lot of people think that prana means breath, but breath is vayu, or breath is svasam, that is breathing. And prana is a little bit deeper, so we talk about the pranayama, uh, the, the pranamaya kosha. That's one level deeper, where the prana goes, travels the energy which is traveling through the pranic channels. And then at a deeper level, prana is consciousness, prana is shakti, prana is, then we talk about adi prana, adi shakti. So it, there is really no difference. It's just another word for consciousness. But we use certain words in certain ways. So, we 
we wouldn't say that it's the Tripura is, is is Prana, but we're referring to Tripura here as pure consciousness and the witness. But everything is Prana, of course, and everything is Shakti as well. So verse 46, 47. Time and space are the limiting conditions of this manifest world. Space is identical to form. Time is identical to action. Dependent on these are dependent as these are on pure consciousness. How can space and time limit consciousness? Tell me of a time and place which is not permeated by consciousness. Without a substratum of consciousness, how can time and space be known? Therefore, consciousness alone exists. The essence of all things that can be indicated by words is nothing but spiritual illumination. Spiritual illumination and consciousness are one. Without self-illumination, nothing can be known. Therefore, illuminate thyself. Only that light, knowledge, is supreme, which is self-illuminated and not dependent on any other means. Unconscious objects like fire, sun or the moon are not self-luminous because they are dependent on the source, which is Maheshwara. Consciousness is self-effulgent. Unconscious objects can be known against the background of consciousness. If you say that objects exist even when they are not in that light, then listen. In that case, they, there would be no consistency in determining the existence or non-existence of objects. All reflections, sorry, as reflections have no existence of their own, so also objects of the world have no existence of their own. As images are seen in the mirror, so the universe is an image in the mirror of consciousness. In reality, consciousness is everything. That which is seen here, there and everywhere, in all forms, is the glory and greatness of that power. A reflection is caused by the clarity of the mirror's surface. Note the difference in the reflections which appear in a clean mirror and in clear still water. Because a mirror is unconscious and does not have freedom of will, it requires an object to reflect. However, consciousness is pure and free and does not depend on an external object. Purity of consciousness needs no evidence. The appearance of many in reality is impurity. To briefly summarize, this world is like a reflection in the mirror. In fact, it's all pure consciousness, but it is reflected in the mirror and it's, it has no reality. It's an illusion. And this appearance of multiplicity is also an illusion because actually there is only one pure consciousness. Everything else, all the objects like the sun, fire, moon, all these lights are not self-luminous because they depend on the light of Atman, which is life itself, is prana itself, it's the witness. Verse 5860. Multiplicity is diversity and is not found in unitary and indivisible consciousness. Objects that do not really exist and appear to exist are all hallucinations. The entire universe is an illusion. So, what's the difference between a hallucination and an illusion? It's just the way we use these words 
and reality, but both are a form of a delusion. It's a mistaken way of looking at things. Hallucinations are we think something exists when it does not. So is an illusion. So there's no difference really. The universe does not appear by itself. It appears as it is because of the self-illuminated existent reality behind it. The mind projects all the colors. Just as the images in the mirror are not any part of the mirror, so the universe and its objects are not any part of consciousness, any aspect of consciousness. Just as reflection is inseparable from a mirror, this entire reflected universe is inseparable from consciousness. A mirror cannot produce an image without an object, but consciousness does not need an object to manifest itself. Look at your own experience, Parshurama. How many images can be projected on the screen of your mind? Sankar Shakti, the power of determination, is a prerequisite for attaining pure consciousness. Without Sankar Shakti or firm determination, a seeker is unable to attain pure consciousness. This universe was manifested by absolute self-existent reality using Sankar Shakti as its instrument. The world is an image of absolute consciousness appears on the background of consciousness. That is why it lasts for a long time. The power of consciousness is perfect because the will of the Absolute determined its manifestation in independently. In the case of human beings, the will remains distracted. With the help of Gems, Mantra, spiritual practice, Power of sovereignty expands, the limitations of experience are minimized. So what do we want to do? We want to limit our experiences. The word experience in English um, is actually different from the original word, which is bhoga. Experience actually sounds good. Why would you want to limit your experience, right? But the word is bhoga. And bhoga means this experience of suffering and dualities, this experience of joy and misery and hot and cold and um, birth and death, and the dualities. So with the help of gems, mantra, spiritual practice, we can expand the power of sovereignty, which means we can expand our awareness and limit our suffering. Shibu asked, gem power means, what does it mean, the power of gems? Uh, gems, yeah, gems are gems. <laughs> Jewels and gems. Stones, that's what is meant by gems. And metals and gems possess certain qualities. And these qualities have a very subtle effect on prana. To use the example of a magnet. Magnet is basically also a metal of, of a kind, a lodestone. It attracts iron. And those who have a little bit of understanding of science know that magnets have a magnetic field around them. We cannot see this magnetic field, but it influences things around. So, if anybody remembers their high school physics, you may remember that these magnetic fields around these magnets were like, um, you know, going from north to south and, and they sort of surrounded the the, the the magnet and when you were within those rings something fell into that uh, a little pin would 
stick to the magnet. The same is with the planet. It has a gravitational field. And if any object comes into this gravitational field, it gets attracted and is pulled into that field. So, similarly, all stones have a kind of a... I'm just... This is a very simplistic explanation. Trying to use modern science to make us understand what is apparently a little bit esoteric is that these gems have an influence, have a kind of a field and they influence us at a pranic level. And so in Jyotish Vidya, which is also a Vidya or a science in India, they would prescribe certain gems like silver, pearls, silver is not a gem, it's a metal, but pearls, etc., certain gems, depending on the person. And you would wear that in order to have a very subtle difference or change in the pranic energy, a pranic field. It's like magnet, you know, you are like a magnet. You also have a field of energy. Some of you have noticed maybe this field of energy, if you go into, and I hope you have not experienced this, that if you are in the presence of criminals, murderers, some very terrible uh, evil, then you feel that very strong negative energy. Some people, those who are very sensitive, may even feel somebody thinking very negatively about you or if you're very sensitive also somebody who's thinking very positively of you so you have times when you you call somebody and the person says hey i was just thinking about you <laughs> and so you were sort of in tune so this is energies which are in tune and use of certain metals and gems helps to transform these subtle Pranic energies. Mantra is a similar thing, it is also an instrument which helps to transform the pranic energy. It's a very, very subtle form of energy as well. Spiritual practice, I think we, we have an idea. There are different forms of spiritual practice, and all these help to expand our awareness levels, to sharpen our buddhi, to purify the active and un latent unconscious mind and in that way to limit our experience of suffering of this duality and so that we don't have to go through that bhoga verse 71 O Parshurama as a magician creates illusory objects for his audience, similarly the objects of the world are illusory, created by self-existent reality. The illusions he wills into existence are seen by all seem permanent, tangible, can be used like gross objects. He then assimilates them. This is the case with the universe. Look at the objects created by the mental power of a yogi. They are stable, even though the yogi's powers are limited. Things created by the yogi appear only outside his body. Consciousness is infinite. Therefore, the universe is enveloped by the power of consciousness. All else is fancy. Only through discrimination and not by any other means can one cut the knots of illusion. Very important statement. Everything is consciousness. And any other ideas you may have is, is all fancy, is fantasy. It's, it's just illusion. So basic nature of the world is pure consciousness. And it's only by discrimination, only by sharpening the buddhi and by no other means can one cut this knot of illusion. 
So that's the only means you have is you have to finally sharpen your bhuti, develop high awareness so that you can cut the knots of illusion. Truth is unchanging, while untruth is constantly changing. Constant change is the nature of the world. Discriminate between that which is ever-changing and that which is changeless. The world comprises both. Know this. The ever-changing image in the mirror is impermanent, but consciousness is everlasting and changeless. That which, is, that which changes constantly cannot be analyzed. As the owl is blinded by sunlight, so ignorance disappears if the right analysis is done. That which is food for one is poison for another. That which is divine for yogis is not divine for ignorant. That's another important line here. Is on the path of spiritual practice, there are certain disciplines to follow. And for those who have no interest in this, this is like poison. And that is not for the yogis. For the yogis, that kind of practice is wonderful. And everybody says, everybody else would say, why are you doing this? Enjoy your life. <laughs> and a yogi would say, I am enjoying my life. I want to do this. I want to do spiritual practice. I want to attain something. While everybody else is supposedly enjoying, but you cannot really enjoy without awareness. So the true enjoyment only happens when you have really attained a high level of awareness. Verse 82, all images reflected in the mirror are images and thus unreal. The universe is like a mirror. Consciousness, seen through it, creates hallucinations. If the world is examined with the faculty of discrimination, it is seen to be illusory. Tripura, the great majesty, shines everywhere. In this way, pure consciousness and the identity of the universe have been systematically explained. So, the bottom line is, the nature of the universe is pure consciousness. And everything that we consider to be the world is in fact an illusion. And to see through this illusion, to cut this knot of ignorance, we need to sharpen our buddhis and do that through practice, mantras and attain that state of high awareness. Any questions, any thoughts, any comments before we end this session? Balaji. Does usage of gems make one dependent on it? Is it recommended to fructify your karma than using gems to avert sufferings? The usage of gems can cause dependence, but you can become dependent on many things. People who use their mantra, mantra can be, for example, also used in a wrong manner. If you've not been trained properly, you can also misuse a mantra and form a dependency. All these things, practice, mantra, gems, all these things are meant to free you, not bind you. If they bind you, there's something wrong in your practice. So they're meant to free you. Remember that. So all these things should be used and we say, it's called Madhu Vidya. And we say in our tradition, it's like, Madhu means honey, or that which is sweet, nectar. So like the bee collects nectar from many flowers, we should also do many practices. Doesn't mean do random practices just from the internet. What I mean is, you repeat, you need to do different things according to your phase in life, according to the need that is required, and grow. And not get stuck and dependent on anything. So there may be a time that perhaps gems, for example, 
is a classic case of usage by those who have still not acquired a higher level of practice. So when you have a higher level of practice, you don't need to use gems. And if you do use gems, you may use it as a complementary method to help you. So use whatever needs to be used to free yourself. You don't have to get stuck to, a, to something. If you have a good teacher who guides you, that's perfect. And such a teacher will also use different methods. For example, if some of you have read Autobiography of a Yogi, Sri Yukteswar Ji recommends the usage of some metals and gems to Yoganand in order to help him through a difficult period of time. And is it recommended to fructify your karma? Well, I would not like to give a general comment on that. It really depends on the person, the situation. In some cases, if the karma is not very harmful, it might even be a better idea to manifest that karma. And instead of using something like gems. So that really depends. Okay, so I guess we are done for today and we will continue next time. Thank you everyone. Uh, yes, Perry, bye bye. Bye bye, Shibu. Turn. Bye. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye, Manisha. Bye, Mika. Miklos, Matthias, goodbye, everybody. Kumuda, bye-bye. Bye, Matthias. -bye. Bye,